I, um, I asked him to lecture not only because I think his work um, is strong and he has been a strong voice in Los Angeles, but also because I thought it was an interesting um, person to hear from because of his relationship to objects and how you work with objects that are found. Um, which I thought also might become useful for the miniatures as these are the so-called um, toilet paper models, which maybe will not be the case, but the idea was that it could and uh, help, hopefully, find um, the preciousness in the composition of those objects that are familiar and everyday. And he was uh, the person that came to mind, in my opinion, to do that with the most successful way. Um, so Andrew Kovacs is a Los Angeles-based architectural designer. Uh, Kovacs' work has been published widely, included, including A Plus U, um, Pit Jing, Project Pool, Perspective Manifest, Metropolis, Claude Domus, and The Real Review. And I'm sure that all the students know, because additionally, Kovacs is the creator and curator of Architectural Affinities, which is an Instagram uh, website um, that is widely viewed uh, and devoted to the collection and display of architectural B-sides. That's what it calls them. Um, uh, Kovacs Design Studio, Office Kovacs, works on projects at all scales from books, uh, exhibition, temporary installations, interiors, homes, uh, speculative architectural proposal, and public architectural competitions. And the, re the recent design work of Office Kovacs includes the Colossal Cacti at the Coachella Valley Arts and Music Festival and an experimental camping pavilion in the Morongo Valley Desert. Um, today, um, he will talk to us how to make model unplugged um, in your home. And he will bring his work and probably more work as an example of that. And I will now text him to see where he's at. He's not here, huh? Okay, but let me, let me text him. Facility met, he um, asked to be able to open a channel of communication with the CC students. And so we thought that uh, usually Wednesday after the career lecture could be a good time for him to set up a few meetings so that you can talk directly to him about how to go about um, the shop facilities, how to access them, how to, you know, give him files, how to help with the construction of things. Um, and so we thought that there should be a time where these questions might be answered or that communication could be open. And, um, and so we thought that Wednesday after the career lecture would be the right time to do that. So clearly we don't see this as a weekly thing, but a need based conversation so that he reaches uh, most people rather than having singular emails or mass emails that nobody reads, uh, more of a conversation where um, you guys can ask the questions and he can answer those questions. So I just wanted to put this to the, into the radar of uh, most of you. Yeah, I mean, again, this is just to clarify, we're still in the mode that if you're out of town, you can use the facilities. We made a list, we sent it to Rodney, you should be communicating with Rodney if you're out of town to what you can do, how you can do it in order to have it ready for July 1st. But if you, for everybody, it, it's going to open right after miniature. So you might want to start planning. And so we're planning towards that opening date of the shop to everybody towards midterm review. So just, I wanted to clarify that the meeting is just going to set you up to see how we're going to start working on after uh, miniatures review. But we stay with our rule that if you're out of town, you can print. Yeah, okay. so I see Andrew there, so. Hi, everyone. We already, I already introduced you. Uh, the students are looking forward to your lecture. Uh, sorry, I didn't wait for you, but uh, I just wanted to entertain them for the first five minutes. And so we're happy to have you and um, you can actually share your screen and start the lecture right away. So I, I introduced you and introduced you why your work fits into the work of the students and why we think it's important for them to listen from you and we're very happy to have you. 
Yes, I'm sorry uh, I'm late. Thank you for having me. Um, for some reason, I thought it was yesterday. I mean, tomorrow. Um, so um, I really appreciate Elena sending me the reminder. Actually, I just went swimming. So um, uh, I, I got out and then I got it. I saw my email from Elena saying, we're waiting for you. And then I looked at my calendar and I was like, oh, no. Um, so I'm really sorry that I'm uh, a little late but I will share my screen. Um, let me see here, one second, just give me a second. Okay. So, um, here we go. Can everyone see it? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Black screen. Black screen right now, yeah. Um, so, so I'm I'm sorry I'm a little late. Um, so normally I like to start um, my talks with uh, this quote. Um, it's a quote I discovered from um, uh, Robert Venturi in a first edition of uh, Complexity and Contradiction. Um, it was a dedication to whoever owned this book before. Uh, I'm not sure if you know who all, everyone knows who Robert Venturi is, but you should look him up along with his wife, Denise Scott Brown, uh, and the work they did. So this was a book that Robert Venturi wrote called, called um, Complexity and Contradiction from uh, 1966. Um, and in this book, this was a dedication written by Venturi to someone else, but it says, um, you don't have to like something to learn from it. And so I always felt that that attitude um, was not only a great one to adopt, but very relevant, say, in the work that I do. Um, and I know Elena asked me to talk about collage, and I'll get into it. Um, but I thought I would start kind of with this project, Archive of Affinities. And I think that the, the Venturi quote, I think, really sums up the ethos of the project of Archive of Affinities. So Archive of Affinities is the um, longest continuous project that I've worked on. Um, probably like in September, it'll probably be like 10 years that I've worked on this project. Um, so it's a project with no deadline, no client, no budget. Uh, it's really like a kind of personal project uh, where I sort of go and I search for images through the, the history of architecture and look for what I at one time called B-sides. So not say projects that are part of the canon, um, but, but say work that exists just on the periphery. just a note that we're looking at a blank, black screen. Is that, that's your plan? No, or okay. no, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So what happened there? So we, we're, we're looking at it. Maybe, you know, sometimes when you go full screen, it doesn't go next. So you have I to see. So, so, so I'm sorry about that, but yes. can you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yes. so sorry about, I'm, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. You no, never kind no, of no, know. No, we were like, we thought that we, you were quoting. So now that, yeah. We're good. So now you see the quote. So, so I'm sorry. Yeah. So I, I was late, and then now I had a technical difficulty. So I already have two strikes against this happens me. Happens all the time, by the way. This is not. This always happens. Yeah, so. we can handle it, Andrew. We can handle it. I have I have two strikes against me in this presentation. Oh wow. So this is really really off to a great start. So sorry about that. So anyway, so here you can kind of see. So Ellen asked me to talk about collage, and 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 really, if in order for me to kind of start talking about collage, I think I I, I mean I have to kind of sort of introduce this project, uh, which hopefully all of you can now see on your screens. Um, and so um, I, I would say that project has a number of different uh, parallels with other types of projects in the history of architecture, but also in the say history or, or also within the discipline of art history. Um, and so maybe the first would be, um, maybe some of you have read this essay it's a really great essay by Colin Rowe, lit, written in the, um, I believe 1949, called Mathematics of the Ideal Villa. And in this essay, Colin Rowe teases out the similarities between, um, similarities and differences between two villas, one by Palladio and um, one by Le Corbusier, right? Um, and it's really this kind of comparative method that drives this essay. And, I, and, and, I, and I'm sort of bringing this up because I think the comparative method in a way is a little bit of a precursor to collage because, or sort of has a connection to collage because at least, at least in the way that I sort of think about it, 
um, collage is the comparative method collapsed, right? Where the distance between, say, these two plans used to compare them, the, dis the physical distance, literally the distance on the page is collapsed where these start to get uh, pieced together. Um, other parallels of this type of, say, image collection project um, might be this wonderful book, I think everyone should look at it if you have a chance, called City Metaphors by Oswald Matthias Ungers, published, I believe, in the 1980s, I think, um, or, uh, and then recently republished. Um, but this kind of amazing book where uh, there's a number of spreads, and on every spread there's um, the plan of a city or a diagram of a city or a map of a city and a visually analogous image um, that then shares one kind of verbal theme here, uh, at least appendages, and then also kind of written um, in German, right? So it's, a, and, it, and it's sort of, you know, many, many, many pages, this book, uh, with examples like this. It's, it's also just like a kind of great design reference if you're stuck. Or say in the art world, um, someone like Saul LeWitt and his um, book called the, uh, the Autobiography. Or now, now we have a kind of new version of this with the proliferation of the internet. So for example, here, a now no longer active Tumblr site called F. Yeah Brutalism, where you have this kind of collection of images. So for me, this, this, this kind of image collection project is really important also in that it lays a kind of foundation or say collection of material that then becomes useful towards collage. Um, here, for example, um, also from art history, the book Atlas, another kind of great visual reference. Uh, at, the book is called Atlas by Gerhard Richter um, and so on. So um, this is another great one, but I, I, I'm sort of, Introducing these is something that I'm constantly thinking about, like say architecture dictionaries, image banks, these types of collections. Uh, a number of architects make them. This is one by Allison and Peter Smithson called The Heroic Period of Modern Architecture. And, and so, so sort of what I appreciate about it as a document is it's almost like a kind of proto, or it's almost like a blog in a book format or a proto blog in a book format. Right, so where you have the most basic information, say the images, the year, who did it, the location, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I sort of kind of mentioned this a little bit, but I think that th these sort of image collection projects um, and in thinking about um, collage become uh, linked together in a way. And that, um, you know, the, the, this, there's a sort of like sort of architects collect material and before the internet architects maybe would collect slides from a slide carousel or postcards that might serve as a kind of visual reference. I think, you know, that is now changing this idea of a kind of image bank is now um, changing also with the idea of the internet and say the content that one might collect. And in the past, I would say architects and people involved in architecture, architecture historians, critics, etc., have used the kind of the say like the format of the image bank to also um, say map out uh, various movements. So this is a chart that I really love. Um, it's from the American architecture historian and also designer uh, Charles Jenks, who I think just recently passed away. Um, but if you look at it here, so he makes this chart in 1972. And he tries to kind of predict the future of architecture, right? So in 1972, he's, he imagines that we might have neo-fascist architecture or biomorphic architecture or service state anonymous architecture. I think even, and then he says here, like around 2000, some other major, in, some, some major invention in question marks. So what I sort of loved about these charts is that here, say like the collection of images or the collection of, of say architectural movements or styles or whatever, however you want to classify it, here was used to kind of somewhat um, project a kind of future. Um, if you go look into the work of Charles Jenks, you'll realize he made a number of more charts. Um, but after he made this chart, he no longer really tries to predict the future. He just maps the present. He just maps the present that he's in. Um, and so 
I don't know, for me, this chart kind of has a sort of unique point. I mean, it's the first one he makes, but it's also very, say, forward looking. So here, for example, are other charts um, full of, say, usual suspects, like we could call them within the discipline of architecture. But these are two charts he makes in the 1980s. You can find them in a special edition of A plus U uh, dedicated to the work of Charles Jenks, uh, where he tries to divide um, what he sees as, as current trends between two major themes, uh, postmodern and late modern. And it, it, you know, there are many things that are, I would say are problematic about this. I mean, it's a little bit like a yearbook of say like the boys club of architects. Uh, there's a lot of say like men that appear uh, in these charts, but at the same time, there's something kind of interesting about them in that there's an attempt to say map the field or map the discipline. And I think for me, maybe some of you have seen this film School of Rock, but it sort of resonates a little bit with this chart uh, where Jack Black, you know, become, in this movie becomes a music teacher and sort of shows the relationships or say affinities uh, between different uh, movements, right? And so affinity is a really great word because it can mean something that I either, I myself might have a personal predilection for, something that I like, or uh, something that might have a relationship to something else. And so, you know, how this uh, plays out in terms of collage, I'll sort of uh, start to get to it. But the project, so this is probably one instantiation of uh, Archive of Affinities, this project that I sort of worked on, uh, here as a very large wall collage, eight feet by eight feet square, that was um, exhibited at the Graham Foundation in Chicago, uh, maybe in like 2015 or 2016 as part of a book series called Treatise. And so this massive wall collage consisted of images that I had sort of collected as part of the project of Archive of Affinities here um, uh, arranged in the background. Images that I would kind of take from that collection to make say other images through a collage like process, as well as physical objects that I started to collect that I would use to say collage into um, physical models in this freestyle kind of way. Uh, at other times, the collection, so this is another sort of version of Archive of Affinities exhibited. So Archive of Affinities really exists as a kind of, kind of like social media account, I guess you could say, or a single folder on my hard drive where I collect all these images. And then at times they're displayed in different ways. Uh, here at a gallery in Chinatown where uh, many of the images collected were silk screened onto a wall. Um, and so, as I mentioned, also, there's a desire, as if collecting images wasn't enough, uh, I also collect these physical objects. Now, one thing to kind of mention, I would say the overwhelming quantity of material um, that I share on Archive of Finney's, at some point, I have scanned it from old media, right? So it's like, like so it's not just simply images I find on the internet and then reshare, re it's sort of images that exist in say old magazines or books that I seek and search out and then I document them uh, and then adjust them and, and, and uh, scan them and share them. But the scanner, and I'm sort of showing this here with the physical objects because the scanner, at least this sort of book scanner, um, acts as a kind of flattening device for physical objects, right? And so, uh, in some ways, kind of not, say, replacing drawing, uh, but maybe kind of parallel to drawing. Many of these physical objects that I gather, I use the scanner to document them. And, and here in, say, two views, as if to suggest maybe a plan or elevation. And I'm always kind of looking for, say, objects that I would, that I would argue have some kind of architectural affinity. Um, so maybe like souvenirs right, or um, kind of a column that you can purchase for a wedding cake, or everyday objects that are oversized, for example, here a colossal dice, or uh, a brick, but rather than it being in an <laughs> made out of clay, it's made out of foam, so a kind of toy brick. So there's always this kind of element or aspect, say, of defamiliarization and, say, collecting these objects and trying to make them useful for the production of architectural models. And so I know it seems 
maybe like ups, like and so it's also kind of imagining these as like buildings so i know it might seem absurd to imagine a cow as a building um uh, but believe it or not an architect way back in the day uh did imagine cows as buildings so you could look him up the very eccentric eclectic architect named jean jacques lecou um and so th th this becomes in a way um sort of part of my process um, at the same time, many drawings are collected as well. Uh, for example, here, a collection of uh, 25 square plans. And so kind of going back to this idea of, say, a B-side or things that are not part of the canon, uh, but maybe have a resonance within the ideas of the discipline of architecture. Like, so one of maybe the, the sort of, when I, when I was thinking about it that way, this is from a while ago, but one kind of example would be this particular document. So this is not an architectural floor plan. In fact, it's a patent drawing. It's a patent drawing for the board game Clue. Um, uh, but it's somehow, but at the same time, it, the design of it is that of a nine square grid, which for a very long time was this trope in architecture, architectural problem. Um, and, and in some ways you could kind of read the patent drawing for the board game Clue through the lens of the disciplinary problem of the nine square grid, but yet Clue was somehow outside the discipline of architecture. So, so could you not somehow link and connect those together? So that was kind of like, I would say, sort of the things I was interested in in collecting, but also, you know, kind of uh, uh, things that exist maybe on the edge of what would be considered the discipline of architecture. So um, here, everyday objects is architecture. So most famously, kind of Frank Gehry's fish, another patent drawing, but here a patent drawing for a duck, which if you know the history of the duck and the decorated shed, it's sort of funny to see a patent of it. But then at the same time, work by artists um, whose subject matter is architecture, right? So Klaus Oldenburg imagining um, a plug as being colossal, or Saul Steinberg here imagining a dresser um, as a work of architecture. And so um, these types of collections kind of emerge out of the project of um, Archive of Affinities. Uh, I'll just like just, this is just kind of quickly to show you like uh, how, how Archive of Affinities has sort of changed over time. So uh, it started in like, sort of started doing in 2010, but then it kind of evolves. Um, and now there's a kind of at least sort of in loose intention uh, to try and say group things as I'm kind of doing them, or it's kind of like curating on the fly. Um, another kind of thing that I sort of love that has kind of emerged out of the project of Archive of Affinities are um, a number of these advertisements for architectural products. Uh, that appear in magazines from the 1970s and 80s. Um, and so maybe some of you have learned this in your history class, um, but the, the sort of well-known architect Bernard Schumi in the late 70s made a number of theoretical advertisements uh, for architecture where um, uh, they were not intended to sell products. But if you actually kind of go look at the advertisements from the same time period, you'll see a kind of unique way, say, of selling these products, you kind of using aspects of humor, surrealism, elevating everyday mundane things into a kind of high form. And but there's also a kind of, as I would say, aspect, say, of um, communication in terms of visual communication uh, in terms of trying to le reach an, a larger audience with these advertisements. So this is a kind of, I would say, sub project of the larger project of archive affinities right or so for example here a kind of uh sink being imagined as a work of art in a gallery um and so you know one of the things that i really like to kind of collect are floor plans and so i sort of showed that image uh or that spread from uh, the mathematics of the ideal villa um where you have a kind of comparison. So, I, and, and during that moment, I sort of mentioned um, collapsing the distance between comparisons. And I would say one image that really starts to kind of sum that up here um, is this this particular image by Le Corbusier. I think it's from 1929, uh, where he 
um, shows his plan on the left here for Paris, right? And so this is Paris. And he basically is proposing to kind of like, you know, demolish everything that's underneath here uh, and sort of, you know, uh, have his new radical vision uh, replace it. But, but I think this image, you know, despite its craziness and radicality is really a type of collage for me, right? Because you have drawing with aerial image, right? You have something that's really kind of high, isolated versus a, a urban fabric that's dense and low. So, so and in some ways, um, Le Corbusier needs the remaining of Paris to argue for how radical his proposal is. And uh, Paris, in order to argue for its preservation, maybe needs um, something as extreme or as radical as Le Corbusier's proposition. But so here, really, the distance between comparing them is collapsed where they're really pinned next to each other, or I would say contiguous touching, um, but where they start to work uh, in conjunction with each other. And so that kind of, these are some of the first sort of experiments in thinking about kind of architecture and collage that I started to do. This is from 2012. So from this kind of collection of images that I had gathered from archive affinities, this would then become the material to say, make new speculations, provocations, architecture competitions, material for exhibitions, um, et cetera. So I started to kind of take entire holes of things that I'd collected, fragments, and piece them together into new compositions, right? Um, really, there was no client involved. They were just made uh, for fun. Um, but this was, I'm, I'm showing this because this was a moment, at least for me, where the project of Archive Affinities started to switch from simply an image collection project and a project that I used to share images to one that became mobilized into a design project, right? Where design was happening, I would say, through a kind of collage process. And at the same time, um, that would happen in the collection of uh, uh, physical objects. So here, kind of number, for some reason, I collected all these columns or all these cubes. Uh, and then eventually those would start to become assembled into other types of speculations. For example, here, a kind of speculation of a stand to sell pears along the roadside, right? Um, so, so, but they also became kind of a way to maybe study a project. So at some point, I think in, uh, maybe it was, it must have been around 2016, I was asked to make a design proposal for a dog park. And this was the site and kind of using these everyday found objects in this collage like way sort of came up with an initial concept of the project. The project never happened. The project eventually was further developed, although it never was realized. Uh, here, this became the plan. So it was kind of conceived as this miniature master plan inside of a larger master plan um, that contained a number of different districts for dog related functions. And so I'm, just, I'm not gonna go through the whole project, but I'll show a little bit of it. So for example, here, like all the kind of pieces and elements in the project kind of were referenced or somehow resonated with material that I collected in the project of Archive Affinities, right? So there was this kind of house scraper for birds <laughs> um, here uh, that kind of came from sort of collecting these many different types of house scrapers. So another thing I sort of noticed in collecting, you know, I didn't kind of set out to find projects like this where a pitched, a pitched roof house was elevated vertically, um, but sort of over time I, I discovered I myself had a personal affinity for these types of projects. So, you know, uh, images I collected were assembled digitally, but then at the same time physical objects were um, assembled into these new types of proposals, which really led to this kind of, I would say, idea of freestyle model making. Um, and at the same time, I would document, and I still do for other projects, document the material that I would collect. So here, a number of different facades from say like train models documented on the book scanner, again, flattened. Uh, and then I would kind of make these sort of architectural speculations here, imagining a house as a bowling pin or other types of compositions um, that would then 
for me at least become useful in the development of other projects. And so, so what I mean by that, like for example, a few years ago, we were asked to participate in an exhibition in Hungary in an old school, I think it was a decommissioned elementary school where a group of architects asked, I would say 12 architects and designers, artists from around the world to make a kind of wall mural, right? So there's this kind of like flattening aspect in using the scanner where it becomes very 2D. Um, which is sort of use, helpful, at least in my view, in terms of thinking about um, collage. Um, and, but but that, would be, that became a sort of way of thinking about um, how, how this method could be used for design projects. So in this project in Hungary, there was this kind of unadorned wall of a school. Um, all, all the walls sort of looked like this. This was the one we were given. And kind of you know, through this process of, say, playing, or a, a kind of freestyle of say adding and you know there were these existing tiles of the wall so we decided to change their color then we started added a kind of generic siding facade with windows a pitched roof uh we turned the pitched roof into a have a brick pattern added this circular window a kind of uh sort of this pipe and and that became this kind of method um to say generate design i guess uh, and so this is a kind of realization, I would say, of that of that work. Uh, here you could see others, um, kind of wall murals as part of the project. So this material that I was collecting, I would document it as part of this project for Archive Affinities. And so it was physical, it was digital. And then once they once these images were digitized, I would kind of play around in Photoshop, making these types of uh, facades or speculations. Um, at the same time, I would also do them physically. And eventually, they started to pile up into these physical models here, um, exhibited at a gallery in uh, Chinatown. This project has no client. Um, it's simply made as a speculation, but it's made as a speculation for, say, a new form of uh, collective living, right? And so um, all of these pieces at some point are just like found in the world. And that's another say aspect of this uh, freestyle model making collage type work, right? So I'll go, you know, go to, to various different locations to collect them. And at some point, you know, so there's a lot of like, a lot of material kind of produced, um, but each was a kind of sort of step. And at some point, the models were also much more extreme or, um, you could even say aggressive, but here the kind of idea, rather than thinking of it, um, I mean, th this sort of idea maybe came right before thinking about this proposal for collective living and kind of evolved out of my master's thesis, which was a project, which, which Archive of Finis also actually was started right before I did my master's thesis and became part of my master's thesis. Um, but you would have this architectural mountain a useless architectural mountain of trash uh, uh, sited in the geographic center of the United States where the users would become architectural mountaineers and climb through the debris of useless architecture. Over time, uh, this started to get cleaned up here at the Chicago Architecture Biennial, a kind of other variation on this proposal for collective living. So really a kind of massive building complex where diversity, many different agendas uh, would not only coexist, but say sit side by side and even, even have to kind of um, work together in terms of like a sort of symbiotic relationship, much like that um, Le Corbusier image of Paris. Um, and so, so I'll kind of present this project a little bit. So this was at the Chicago Architecture Biennial. Uh, one of the things we were asked to do was to reimagine a well-known interior. Uh, we, we were able to pick it. Uh, I picked this interior. It's in London. I'm not sure if any of you know it, um, but you, sh you should look it up. And if you ever are in London, you should visit it because it's really a kind of overwhelming experience. So this, this is this, the Sir John Stone House at Lincoln Infields. Um, it's basically three houses that this architect, he was kind of like a sort of madman architect. Um, he purchased these three houses and over time filled it with this um, collection. So if you go there, 
it's pretty overwhelming just in terms of the quantity of material. Um, and so I was, I was drawn to that again, thinking about like architects and collecting, et cetera. And so, but, but our idea was not to keep Soane's collection. In fact, we sort of wanted to eliminate Soane's collection and update it with a collection for say the 21st century. Or another way you could think of it is if Sir John Soane had lived forever, what would he also start, like what new things would he start to collect, right? So uh, we kind of sort of but just wanted to kind of rethink that a bit. But, you know, this was the site we were given, which was basically um, this plinth. And um, we realized we couldn't make the sewn section to scale appropriately to the site. So we said, okay, we're going to make one of these collective living models. And they said, okay, how are you going to do it? And we said, we're going to freestyle it. And they said, what do you mean? And we said, like in sports, uh, here is the definition states, performance or routine featuring relatively free, unrestricted movement intended to demonstrate an individual special skill or style. And they said, okay. So then we um, got to work collecting material. This was the team uh, that made the project here arranged by height, small, medium, and large. Um, and we went around um, very, to various sources to collect material that could be useful for, for this model. So this was at a thrift store. We went to a 99 cent store, but we were looking for material that had um, a resonance with architecture, right? So the duck and the decorated shed. So we would find kind of ducks, uh, pyramids used to make sand castles, leaning towers used to make sand castles. Um, we went to high-end paper stores. Uh, I'm not sure if any of you know the artist Thomas DeMond, but Thomas DeMond apparently buys his paper from this high-end paper store for his art projects. Uh, but we would buy the scraps of paper, which all were under a footprint of eight and a half by 11. Uh, but the, the proprietor of this store would sell the scraps for like 10 cents, 15 cents, and 25 cents of high-end paper. Uh, we would also visit um, street markets here, one by MacArthur Park. And this guide eventually was produced uh, of 10 locations of where you could go purchase material uh, that would be useful in terms of freestyle model making, right? right? So that was a kind of other aspect of, of things that uh, there isn't just one source where you can gather material. There's say many different sources to gather material and then many different strategies to say alter that material uh, in the process of assembling it. And then in the process of assembling it, this is kind of what the studio space looks like. It's pretty messy, I would say. Uh, you know, it's, it's a kind of workshop, like everything that we collect needs to be cleaned. Uh, you know, sometimes we find things on the street, so we clean it all. A lot of things are painted, um, but then there's this also kind of, say, layering of the, the objects um, with other material. Uh, so, yeah, so for, for example, here you see material being cleaned. This is, um, I think, like a drawer purchased from a Goodwill. Uh, this is a cupcake that's used as a piggy bank. Here you could see where the, the hole was to, to, to place money, but we would sort of patch these objects up or, or alter them a little bit to, to make them useful for our architectural model. So this cupcake piggy bank became patched up and altered really to kind of celebrate its form, I would say. Um, but then again, like everyday objects, for example, here, this is the cap of a, of a, of a, of a glue bottle. Uh, was sort of cut up into pieces and used to become a planter in the model, right? So there was this kind of obsessive level from the overall composition down to the detail of how we could use these everyday objects in constructing the model. This is what the model looked like maybe um, about a quarter of the way through. So it's an incredibly dense uh, construction. But even the pieces that are far deep in the model were given the same kind of treatment, right? So everything, like it, it wasn't just we went to the store, found things, and then threw them in the, in the model. Like everything, there was a, a, a long process between say when things were collected, we sort of evaluated them, then we started to alter them, and then they became their own mini compositions. And then at some point, these mini compositions started to aggregate into a much larger composition. Um, and then, you know, so 
you know, in, I show this slide just in terms of like thinking about representation uh, and, and drawings. Um, we didn't make drawings for this new proposal for collective living. Um, so it, it then became a kind of problem of like, how do we document this work, right? Like, how do we document this model in a way other than just photographs of the model, right? So there, the same scanner, this uh, book scanner that was useful, that is very useful in the Project of Archive of Affinities became useful in documenting here the rubbish or the trash uh, of the construction process of the model. Um, and, it, you know, it, it, I think at the same time also produces these images here that I think are quite compelling, this kind of useless galaxy of architectural dust, right? And so um, many <laughs> piles of rubble were dumped on the scanner uh, as a way to create a form of documentation or representation of the project um, that was not simply just photographs or images of the model or just drawings of that model. And um, this became a kind of a, another sort of obsessive quality just in terms of thinking about like archiving where many different facades that we used in the process of constructing this model were documented. Many different types of textures of paper that we had collected from the paper store were documented. Here, the off cuts of paper were documented. Um, here, they were just arranged by color, some of the facades. And so this is a kind of like ongoing uh, project, but this is here kind of the result of the final uh, model, some zoom ins. That's a SpongeBob. There's, there's the cupcake. And then this is the model um, uh, in downtown Los Angeles before it was um, driven to Chicago. So this was also kind of part of the project. I, the model was basically made up of thousands of pieces, right? All collected uh, over time. Here, this was, a, this was the kind of informal Los Angeles opening of the, of the model just right on the street. Um, and so I, I was totally terrified that if this model was going to be shipped, it would just fall apart. So I insisted that I drive it uh, to Chicago from Los Angeles. And so we had, to, this, we had to kind of spec out then what car we could rent in order to fit the model. Um, and the model actually made it there totally fine. Uh, after the biennial, the model was shipped to Tokyo and is in to is, is is in disarray. It's in pieces in Tokyo somewhere, right now. Um, so I think you know this this was this um, biennial was what in I think um, 2017. Um, so at that time, um, you know the success at least one way to think of the success of an architectural project at a biennial could be measured by how often it appeared on Instagram, right? So these are not images that I took, but rather images uh, others have taken of, of the model and then uh, shared on Instagram. So that became this other kind of aspect of collecting, uh, collecting the way um, everyday people would sort of circulate the work in a kind of public sphere, right? And so for example here, I don't know who core underscore me underscore Adam is, but core me Adam called it Island of Misfit Architecture, hashtag neo postmodernism. Uh, and then Keon Hole said, you just don't like postmodernism. Some hashtag, hashtag bring postmodernism back. And then Emrose Price just said, hashtag grateful. Um, and so I think that's kind of interesting. I mean, this is an old statistics, but I think that's kind of interesting in, in terms of thinking about this statistic. So this is from 2016. So it says every minute or every two minutes, humans take more photos than ever existed in total 150 years ago. So I think that is a really profound thing if you think about it just for a second. So like every two minutes, we take more images than existed in total 150 years ago, right? So there's this kind of endless an accelerated proliferation of images that we encounter in our everyday lives, right? Like this kind of bombardment of images, either 
you know, on our social media feeds, and everyone is participating in it in some in some capacity, right? Whether you're an architect sharing your own work, or you're a student sharing student work, or you know, you're sharing um, kind of inspo, for lack of a better word. We're constantly sort of bombarded by this, and then I think there are these other platforms like Pinterest. Uh, and Tumblr, which which I'm, 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 I, I see their value, but also start to actually, I think, chip away a little bit at kind of what we call the discipline of architecture in a productive way, I think. And so um, maybe some of you know this, but this is when um, Facebook's algorithm uh, failed. Uh, <laughs> and this is how Facebook at Facebook's algorithm reads images. So it says image may contain night sky and outdoor image may contain flower image may contain tree sky outdoor and nature right so all these tags image may contain people standing um i think if you were to if facebook's algorithm was to fail with these images it might say image may contain pink wall um so i'm, I'm not sure everyone knows it but this is actually a local highlight you can go visit it it's the paul smith wall in uh west hollywood which has become this kind of iconic Instagram backdrop. At the same time, there has also been some resistance to it, right? So for example, here in art, but the, even the resistance, I would say reinforces it as this kind of uh, selfie attractor and location, right? And so one of the things that I kind of love about this location, I mean, it's a pretty straightforward building uh, and it's a relatively blank wall that has just been colored pink, right? Uh, that people swarm to effectively to take these kinds of selfies, right? These very um, composed shots. But as soon as you move the camera, like for example, in this image, uh, you see people interacting and engaging with architecture and public space in a way that's that's different than say, every other normal building, right? So this is the Paul Smith store that there's this kind of parking lot in front of it. And here you see kind of people, you know, engaging in the built environment in a totally uh, different non-normative way. Um, and, you know, just to kind of uh, sort of, you know, show you that I'm kind of rigorous about this, this is the design of a pink wall store for Calvin Klein uh, by Louis Barragon from 1982. So Louis Barragon didn't design this store, but he designed um, another store that never happened. And this I kind of discovered only in doing, say, the project of Archive Affinities, right? So I would have never kind of come across this Louis Barragon pink wall Calvin Klein store that was never realized. Um, but, but somehow this project, I think, and this project, they not only have a resonance, but the, I think at least to me demonstrates there's a kind of uh, place for this within the discipline of architecture. So that leads me to uh, this next project that I'll just kind of quickly go through, Coachella. Uh, maybe some of you know it, uh, one of the most uh, successful music festivals in the world located uh, here in California. Uh, this past year it was canceled due to the coronavirus, but in 2019 it was not canceled and I had the great honor and uh, privilege of being able to participate and do an art installation. So this is kind of what it normally looks like, Coachella normally looks, looks like. It's a polo field, it's a giant fairgrounds in the middle of the desert. Um, and you know, of course, the selfie is very prevalent if you go to Coachella, right? Like if you go to Coachella and you don't take a selfie, you probably didn't go, right? So, but but in some sense, it, it becomes a magical experience for, for hundreds of thousands of people that they share instantly with millions through uh, various social media platforms. So this was kind of our initial proposal. We wanted to create a gathering space for people uh, that would really be um, uh, in a kind of shaded area. So we really create a kind of shade structure that would, would act as a gathering space, right? Because Coachella's in the desert, it can get really hot, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we wanted to make something that was kind of functional or useful, even though it was only for say two weekends. So um, we, th this, these were some of the initial studies in terms of making physical models, kind of pretty straightforward scheme, just of a number of different walls uh, that supported this one pink roof. Um, 
and and they sort of liked it, but they were really drawn to this profile, right? So while making this model, one of the wall walls had a profile of a cacti, and so they really kind of went for that, and that became um, the driving force of the design at that point. But here again, we were using this kind of freestyle model process, really of just playing and brainstorming while model making to kind of come up with ideas, right? Because we didn't kind of know, we, like we didn't know what we wanted to propose, but we just would start making stuff and um, sort of have a conversation about them with us internally. And by us, I mean, say me and the people that are helping me, uh, and then a conversation with the folks over at um, Coachella, right? So this was, was actually the very, I'm not showing you the very first model we made, but they hated it. They hated it and I thought we weren't gonna, it wasn't gonna happen. And I said, can we please try again? Can we please try again? They said, sure. So we tried this one and then they were like, we like this cacti shape. And so we kind of went from there. <laughs> um, and so this was, we sort of then kind of really sort of tried to run with this cacti form or cacti shape, which I think when once stylized, um, becomes very architectonic. Um, and so here, this was an earlier model, obviously this version didn't happen, but this was a, another sort of freestyle model that we made of this, I would call it like a cacti jungle gym, right? Where um, we used the elements that I sort of collect to make uh, this proposal. And you can kind of see here, like, you know, there's bits of paper from the paper store this, these are fish tank decorations, right? Like these, some of these facades come from train model collections. This is just from like the plexiglass store. This is from Home Depot. This is like a toy, right? So there was really like this kind of mix or collection of stuff that we use in a way um, to design. Uh, this was too extreme for them. Also just in terms of like thinking about safety. So we started to tone it down. Uh, in terms of like actually making it into something plausible. So here it was say um, three cacti that all shared a similar green tone and then this kind of white splatter. Uh, and then of course, thinking about say references of the cacti in popular culture. So uh, this is maybe some of you know it, I'm not sure. Um, this is a claymation uh, from the show Gumby right? Uh, there's the show Gumby. And then in this episode, they, it takes place in the desert. Um, but if you kind of watch the background, there are all these kind of funny little cacti shapes that appear. So that became, you know, we were kind of gathering, trying to become sort of experts in uh, the way cacti had sort of infiltrated popular culture, for example, here, uh, which was prominently featured on a t-shirt a while back. Um, but also kind of um, you know, I discovered these sort of old postcards here, um, a kind of proto selfie, right, of, uh, or a selfie before selfies, here are people taking selfies with cacti, of just giant cacti in Arizona, and here uh, people gather to take a photograph with it, right, or, I mean, there's, there's something kind of, to me, strange and surreal about these images of these sort of, say, old-timey cars and like, I mean, they must be wearing like winter coats and they're in the desert, right? Like it just seems like, just like really uncomfortable to be there. Uh, but there's something I think about these images that also uh, resonated. So this became the final uh, proposal that we submitted. Again, we didn't actually digitally model this at all. We just made physical models. Um, and again this kind of freestyle process like you can sort of see here this red is a little different than this red and the result of that is really just we probably didn't have a piece of red paper that went the whole way because when we would buy paper from the paper store it was all less than a footprint of eight and a half by 11 right so inevitably that became part of this collage process right um but we had sort of pr proposed again this kind of gathering space uh, where each face of the cacti would have a different color. Um, and, and so this is, this is actually, this is from the submission package. So uh, we didn't digitally model any of this, but again, it was about say physically making things as we were making and discussing them as we were making them and then using those objects um, to document them through say images here uh, to make the presentation. 
and so uh, we had initially proposed uh, a grouping of four cacti, and then they said, okay, it's great, you're gonna do it. We're gonna, we wanna do the cacti, but can we have seven? Which is kind of one of the most amazing things I think you could ever hear as an architect, because most of the time it's like, can you do less, less, less? This time they came back and they said, can we have three more? And it was like, that's, I, absolutely, you can have three more. Um, and so here you can kind of see, these are the four big ones. Uh, and these were made out of wood, basically wood boxes that were stacked uh, and then anchored to a telephone pole that was anchored in the ground. Uh, and then the three small ones were made out of steel uh, with the idea that they would become permanent afterwards, which is still uh, in discussion. Uh, and then, so this is kind of what uh, the project looked like. So it really became, uh, so it really meant to be this kind of gathering space. These are photos by Ewan Bond, um, the morning before the festival. And then so, but really we kind of wanted to create this sort of gathering space, hence these uh, plinths, uh, which people could sit on, hang out on, lounge, listen to music, people watch, meet people, etc. Uh, and our kind of installation was located somewhat in the center of the overall fairgrounds. So I don't know, you know, some of you may have been to Coachella, some of you may not. This was the first time I had ever gone to Coachella, but it is very much like an adult Disney World and highly organized and logistical, right? So it was kind of, we were kind of given this sort of really prime spot uh, where it became a kind of sort of meeting point for people at the festival. Uh, and then one of the other things it did, so throughout the day, the stems of these cacti would cast shadows and uh, people would kind of use those shadows to sort of hang out uh, throughout the space. And then um, kind of playing up this idea, say, of collecting found objects and using the found object in actual, um, say, design. Here, the use of road reflectors. So what you see on the median of a highway as you're going really fast became useful for us in, in translating, say, the spines of the cacti, right? And they became this other sort of gridded, um, element to give the, the, the cacti another layer. And so most of them were white in this kind of gridded formation, but then every now and then, because you can buy road reflectors in different colors, uh, we switched out um, every now and then with a, a, a brighter complementary color. Um, so what kind of ended up happening though, uh, is that Coachella, it be, like our installation became like this selfie mosh pit for some reason like tens of thousands of people uh, started to take these selfies and kind of share them on the internet, right? And so in a weird way, that became another kind of aspect of the project in terms of collecting uh, this work. Uh, but for example, you know, this gentleman of the account of mice and menswear took a picture, but again, as soon as you like move the camera, like you see people engaging with architecture in a very different way that they normally would, right? And so uh, it, was, it was kind of fun to, to just be in this selfie mosh pit and sort of watch the different ways people might um, engage with the built environment. So one of the things, you know, after kind of the, doing the project, I realized, oh, I can go purchase an image of my own design on Getty Images for 475 euros if I want the large version, right? The small, ver the small version DPI is a little cheaper, but thankfully through this kind of like selfie mosh pit, um, all these people that I had no idea who they are, um, shared, took images and shared uh, their experience um, on social media, which then became sort of uh, useful for me in terms of uh, collecting the, the material. But so in some ways, the reason I'm kind of showing this is because the sort of process of say collecting images to then using those images or objects in the design process uh, here helped generate a design that then became a backdrop from with which people took many images and recirculated that on the internet, right? So like, um, and then again, like here, our design was copied. So I didn't know about this show until someone told me this, but um, 
maybe some of you know it, it's this popular culture show called The Masked Singer, um, where people, celebrities apparently get dressed up in costumes and sing songs. Uh, and our design uh, for this particular episode was in the background, although we were not consulted. And so here you could see the plinths were pretty janky. Uh, I mean, this was just uh, like really kind of stage design. Uh, also, you could see that the arms of their cacti didn't, uh, they all went past the stem of the cacti, but the stem of our cacti always was taller than the arms. Um, and you can see here, they also mimic the grid of the road reflectors, but rather than using road reflectors, they just painted them on. So um, I, don't, I, I don't really watch this show, um, but a friend of mine sent it to me and said, I hope you had something to do with this. And I said, oh, no, no, I, had, I, I don't know anything about this. And then I contacted them and they said, um, they, they settled with me. So they just gave me some money, basically. So I got, it was actually kind of really nice because I sort of, uh, I owe my friend a really nice dinner for, for showing me or for, for watching this show. Um, so I guess the, the last project I'll show, which is also in the desert, it was a project that actually happened literally about a year ago. Uh, this is what the site looked like when we got there. This was done with a group called Space Saloon, a really interesting uh, design build group. You should look them up. Um, and I, uh, our particular project, uh, I collaborated with an architect from New York, uh, a licensed architect named Kyle May. Uh, and so this is what the site looked like. So I would say this project is a little bit like say, design, build, freestyle, and collage, right? Like it's sort of taking, trying to do like to scale up the method of the models into something much larger. And so uh, this, this is what the site looked like. And then this is what we did. It, we, we worked, uh, it was about a week. We had a team of maybe, uh, it sort of shifted in its size, but maybe 10 to 15 people. Uh, and it was a pretty kind of grueling endeavor because this is what it looked like before. And then a week later we did this. And our idea was basically to make a structure that could serve as a kind of uh, pavilion that one could camp on in a desert, right? So, uh, but really we made this kind of villa for camping. Uh, and we, so we created a number of these different platforms um, that you could set up a kind of camp. Um, and the pink here are uh, yoga mats just ordered from, uh, Amazon Prime. Um, and, and, and again, there was this kind of aspect uh, of model making to study the project here, kind of thinking. And the reason we called it dots was because we had this kind of grid of columns that would provide this rigid infrastructure within which we would then have a kind of flexible infill of deciding what each quadrant or dot might be. Uh, this is one of the drawings. Again, we didn't really make drawings. This was one of the drawings just in thinking about what it might be. This is really like as a team, as a group um, on site, this was kind of how we figured out uh, the plan. So this was probably, this I think actually became the drawing that became the final plan of, um, uh, of, the, of the pavilion. And then, you know, the owner of the site happened to also have this junkyard. So we went to this junkyard also as a group and collected a number of objects and material that we would use for the infill of the site. Yeah, here's the plan. Uh, there was like this, these two big uh, bushes uh, that we didn't move at all. And then so this became uh, the project. Um, and so there were, there, you know, we, we had a kind of loose idea, say of this uh, rigid framework or infrastructure of these columns. Uh, some things we ordered in advance that we knew we would collage as part of the project and some things we found as we were doing it. So there was this kind of uh, mix between elements um, that we were collaging. And so this was, I mean, there was really kind of no real way to enter it or not enter it. You could have entered it sort of anyway, but here one of the platforms ramped down as a kind of way to help you come up. This was a swing. Uh, as part of the project. Uh, this was jokingly what we said where you entered the project, this door that we just found uh, in a junkyard. Then there was this kind of hammock that you could kind of hang out at. Um, but the idea was that you would have a number of these different levels that sort of loosely stepped up that would provide views that um, you could use to camp at um, 
uh, overnight. And I, I actually stayed there one night. And then one night, I think we also had a, so we also used it as a stage and had a band uh, perform. And then on the top of each of the columns, for some reason, uh, this was uh, Kyle Mays, the, the architect I collaborated with. We capped each of the columns with a mirrored piece that would reflect the sky. Although most of the time you would never see the, that piece of mirror. Um, so here were kind of other elements gathered uh, from the junkyard that we sort of painted and altered and used as kind of infill uh, within uh, this rigid infrastructure. Here's one of the bushes that we sort of worked around in terms of uh, the framing. And then these are the, say, four, view, four views of the project. This is kind of it in the landscape. Um, OK, so yeah, so I would say, like, just in terms of thinking about collage, there's this kind of collection process that's part of it, um, either as, say, kind of image collection um, or artifact collection. So I collect, I use this project of archive if needs really as a way to collect material but also to collect artifacts. So here, um, also then the, the use of the scanner or the role of the scanner becomes important in terms of thinking about how the scanner at least also becomes a kind of useful design tool uh, for me. So there's kind of the collection of images, the collection of artifacts that then lead through this say collage process, a kind of say image production, uh, which I then, whether for one reason or not, I then usually share uh, on the internet, as well as say artifact production. Sometimes these models are made for competition. Sometimes, as I showed you, made for fun. Sometimes the study models. In this particular case, this model was made to be shown um, in Milan as part of an exhibition. Uh, but here we made the model uh, in a Makita drill case because we knew we had to ship it, right? So the drill case itself became part of the overall object. Um, and actually allowed for safe shipping of these models because you can imagine that after kind of experience of making these models, often once a model is finished, it instantly enters its de deterioration process, right? Like as soon as a model is done, it already starts to like decompose in a way. So the the, the drill case here was was not only important in referencing the content of the exhibition, which I won't get into right now, but became useful as a way to ship uh, itself. Um, but at the same time, these kind of, the, the production of artifacts are say used in um, making architectural competition or, or used in say uh, developing designs for architectural competitions here, one that we didn't win. Uh, but here the scanner became useful in, in this particular project also as a way of creating documentation or representation of what we were proposing. And then kind of the ambition sort of became to take these small little follies, I would call them. So folly, it's like a useless work of architecture um, that we were making just from pieces that we collected and start to make them one-to-one. -one. And so that became a kind of aspect of say architectural production where collage was happening at a one-to-one -one scale, um, at least keep it still remaining in a kind of gallery um, environment. And then here, a kind of other version of trying to make these small little models that we were developing into actual one-to-one -one proposals. Here, another, here's a proposal, here's a, a realized project for um, turning an Airstream trailer into a mobile store where again, the collection of found objects became useful as an apparatus upon which um, you could hang bathing suits, which is what they were selling here. Uh, and then that has also kind of translated into um, other types of, say, interior projects where maybe the e extremeness of collage or, say, bright colors isn't always uh, coming through. But, for example, in this particular project, uh, the, co the collage aspect, I would say, came through in the door stops. Um, so these are just uh, the, the this was an interior renovation of a home in Los Angeles. Um, and here. The home already had these existing door stops. And, and so what we did was we just went and purchased, here you can kind of see it, it's a little faint, but these rubber black door stops from Lowe's and just began to collage over them. So we used the existing form of a door stop, right? And then that's what that is here. 
And then we just kind of collaged many different types of textures that we had um, in the office or that I've collected over time as ways to kind of turn these doorsteps into maybe something more uh, totemic. So sorry I was late. I hope that was kind of interesting. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Andy. It was great. Um, I would like to uh, thank you for this exhaustive lecture and also uh, invite the students if they would like to ask a question. I'm sure there are some. And meanwhile, while they think about it, I will just write. I will just read to you a question that uh, Jackie um, asked. One question I wanted to ask was about authorship in relationship to when you mentioned that your model ended up in shambles in Tokyo. What were your instructions to put it back together or were there any? I'm thinking of instructions and certificates of ownership by artist uh, Lim Lambie. Um, that's a great question. Like, so, um... Well, I guess I'll just answer the practical question first. The model, I think, is still in pieces in Tokyo, right? Like, we've been trying to find a way to repair it. Um, but but in some ways, sorry? Uh, in, in some ways, it's okay that it's in, in pieces because um, that's how the model, in a way, also started, right? Like, it was in pieces. Um, and that kind of leads to the question of authorship. Uh, which I think is a great one. So many of these models um, are made in collaboration with other people, right? Like the model for Chicago that was shipped um, to Tokyo was made uh, with three people, including myself, really. Three, so three people, including myself. And it was made over a series of months. Um, and I would say that um, in producing that model, we certainly had a lot of discussions or kind of critiques, I guess, of, of back and forth about what things could be. But, you know, m maybe th there were, there were, there's certainly multiple authors to the work that uh, I do, right? Um, but at the same time, there's also the author that made the thing beforehand, right? Like, so there's the, the author of whoever made the cupcake, which I don't know, actually, who made the cupcake, because we just found it at like a Goodwill. Um, and we didn't really care to do any research into who made the cupcake. Um, but there's also, I guess, that aspect of authorship, like someone else made that, but then there's an aspect of authorship in terms of altering um, those objects. If that makes, if that kind of answers it. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I would like to invite the students if they have questions, either to type them in or to just unmute yourself and ask the question. Hi, Andrew. I, I just have a question regarding color palette. Um, do you, over like the collection of these objects, and you said that you repainted some of them, do you have like a color palette that your office uses? Um, yeah, yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, so I'm gonna just answer it quite honestly. No, we don't have a color palette. Um, but I will say that like, I like bright colors. Right. So, and, and, and the reason I would say we don't have a color palette is because like, I would say a lot, a lot of the times the, the material that I collect, maybe 80 to 85% of the time that is somehow altered, but there's like a 20 to 15% chance that we somehow keep an aspect of something that we might find. Right. And usually that might be an appealing quality of its color, right. Or its texture or its form, right. Like usually, in, like in terms of co collecting objects, like the form, the shape will kind of stay the same unless we start adding other pieces to it. But the color is something that we can start to alter. I wouldn't say that there's a defined color palette other than say like bright, fun colors. Like that's the only rule for me. I think other people might be a little more rigorous in terms of really being strict about a palette. Um, I would say, you know, I, I think it depends on each particular project and there are different types of tricks like sort of graphic tricks you can do with color right like color blocking something or desaturating things to kind of make it read as one thing but like what I'm after in terms of the models the physical models are many colors not just one color not a single color. even though in the past I've made models with just a single color right so I, I think 
you know, in, in some of the models, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get a re, like a flickering between like an overarching density of quantity of stuff, right? Between like a more zoomed in reading of uh, articulate or where you can articulate each individual piece, right? So I think color plays a role in that aspect, but, but there isn't a very, like I don't have a set color palette, I would say. I mean, I mean, I know that I like in terms like I know the paint colors that I buy like from the store, you know, so like I know that, but like so maybe like there's there's like an indirect palette, but not like a really like I, and, I, and the reason I say is because I'm pretty sure other offices, architects, designers, artists might have a much more rigorous process than I do in terms of thinking about color. Hi, Andrew. Um, I just have a quick question about how you go about collecting these items because um, you kind of started uh, the lecture saying that it kind of stemmed from collecting images and then it turned into uh, collecting the objects. Um, but do you have like a certain criteria of the objects that you go out and buy and collect to create these models or how does that work? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, again, like the color palette, I mean, I think that there's a little more of there. There's a little more rigor, I would say, into collecting, like how I collect the object, how we collect the objects. Um, so I would say, like the first thing is like I'm looking for things that have a resonance to architecture, right? So like the column it being used in the wedding cake, I think, is a very straightforward example. But another way that we started to think about it is because we, like knowing that they would become these like immense compactions of many objects, right? Like one of the things we would start to think about is like, well, how can one thing meet another thing, right? Or like the weight of something and like where it goes, right? Like something really, really heavy, maybe doesn't necessarily go on the top of the model, but more towards um, the base of the model. In, in terms of like, you know, the, it, I guess it's a little like, you know, like some chefs might go to certain markets to get certain vegetables or certain, you know, fish from here or there, right? Like, so like th th that's, I guess, like how I think about the locations, like, oh, I can go to the paper store to get really high quality pieces of paper that I'll use to like patch and cover up a mask, right? Or uh, so, I, I mean, you know, I, I guess I'm looking for things that are useful in the construction of an architectural model that have a kind of architectural resonance, hopefully to a broader audience, right? And by broader audience, I also mean like not architects, right? So um, like, I think if, I think it's kind of safe to say that if you were to ask like a child to draw a house, they would draw something with a pitched roof. I think it's, I think most, more often than not, I think that would be the end. So like that is somehow, I'm not saying it's good or bad, but that is somehow like what is recognizable to a larger group of people as architecture, right? So I feel like th there's that kind of pop aspect of things to try and make it not only disciplinary, but say something that's recognizable to a broader group of people. If that, does that, that sort of answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. There is also um, a question um, from Nero. Hi, Andrew, thank you for the lecture. My question is, how does the collage quality of your model translate to real scale architectural constructions? Do you think it is important to show the collage aspect of your architectural design or it is only a process you take? Yeah, excellent. I think that's an excellent question. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess like one way I would answer it is by saying, you know, as projects get bigger, right? Like, or become realer or like a, you know, like real work of architecture, more people are involved, right? So in some sense, like they're the model that when, when it's at the scale of the model, there's much more freedom, right? If that makes any sense. I think as like the, for example, in the interior renovation, uh, there's a client there, right? Like that's like, so it couldn't be too weird, 
right? Like it had to kind of be straightforward. So like, you know, I didn't show it here in, the, in this presentation, but like one of the say collage aspects there is a handrail, which is really a number of cables um, that are uh, made from airplane cable, right? So it's not a typical ring. I wish I should had the image to show you, but I don't have it right here. Um, so I think like the collage aspect as things get bigger becomes a little more challenging just in terms of like who the client is. Um, I would say that like in the other project in the desert where it was really like a group of architects, artists, designers, and students, like there the collage aspect became a sort of um, like kind of one-to-one -one mix between say building material, right? And some of the kind of installations that I showed, like the collage aspect there is like purchasing an old window, right? Or going to a kind of say like architectural junkyard or building supply junkyard and purchasing certain objects that could be useful that sort of collage against say typical building uh, methods, if that makes sense. It does. Um, thank you, Andrew. Yeah. Other question, guys? Hi. Um, I would like to know if you have a certain process of scanning uh, 3D objects in order to be able to flatten it and how the flattened objects then translate into your final model, because that's something that I have been working on in my thesis, and I wanted to know your process to it. Sure. Um, well, the flattening really comes because it's a book scanner, right? So it's because it's like a book scanner, what is produced is in 2D, right? So, uh, but at the same time, like we've used the scanner to say document very small physical compactive collages, I guess you could say. Um, and we've used the book scanner to document them there. Um, I don't know if there's like a real relationship between say like the scanner and the models, but the scanner becomes useful not only as this kind of documenting archiving tool. Uh, for example, like, I mean, here's one way to think of it. Like for, for now, I'm for example, one project that I'm working on now, which every week, switches from being like it's either going to happen or it's not going to happen because of the pandemic which is kind of frustrating I mean it's an art project um, but the idea like so last week it was not going to happen now it might happen so but anyways this 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 is a project that I'm working on that absolutely uses the scanner right so one of the things that's kind of great about like I mean the scanner I, I just bought it like just to scan books but then I started using it to scan physical objects, right? Which is not necessarily its role. But one of the great things about the, the scanner and like, you know, uh, is you can change the, the resolution, right? So like you can, if you scan a quarter at a really high resolution, the image of the quarter is bigger than the quarter itself, right? Yeah. And so that, and there are medical devices that go up to like 8,000 DPI, but the problem is they have like really small beds. Right. Uh, so like the one thing I'm trying to do now, and you've probably seen this, like, especially in like uh, European cities where there's a building under construction and they erect um, a scaffold scrim and mm -hmm. the scrim has the image of the building on it. Mm -hmm. you've, pro you've probably seen this. Right. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do now is to take this material that I've collected. So like to take a basically a toy facade, scan it at such a high resolution that it becomes one to one, basically, right? Mm -hmm. So to basically scale, to basically use that idea of say, the high resolution where the image of the quarter is bigger than the quarter itself, well, can you not then scale up like the plastic brick to be one to one or close to one to one brick size, right? So that's a kind of new sort of thing that I'm trying to do where like, I'm sort of trying to push the, the archiving aspect of the scanner really as a kind of design tool um, but 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 really I mean for me the scanner was has always just been this kind of um, for lack of a better word like dumb object that, you know I just used to like scan images from books mm -hmm. but then had, like I sort of started to scan pieces of models 
projects as well. And it, it kind of has opened up a little bit, uh, opened up some avenues of other, say, usefulness towards design. Does that Thank kind you. of answer it? Thank you. Um, we also have a question uh, from Yash. I have a question regarding the quality of aesthetic across the work. I mean, is there a law slash rule that involves in display of found objects, apart from the weight and physics that builds a series of work from your practice seem to have a crazy language? Is there an accident or just a conscious decision made in the process of archiving? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that I, I like. I, I think there are loose rules. They're not like so definitive, right? So like, I don't think I could give you. I mean, I could like the, if if I were to say give you a set of rules and then like, you know, you would go make the model on your own. I think you would make it something like the, the the way I guess I like to think about rules is to set up rules or got really I would call them guidelines that allow for freedom of design, right? So I think like there are certain aspects of things that like I know I want it, we know we want it to be, like we, we, we know we want it to be dense. We know what we want it to have like a lot of quantity. We know we want it to be really colorful. We know it want it, want it to appear kind of random looking, right? So I would say like those are, I would say like goals or benchmarks we try to reach in the process, but there isn't, a sort of set of rules that we start out with to make something. Uh, in other projects, I have made sort of some loose rules to help me make the work, but rules aren't such a overwhelming um, aspect to it. There's a kind of, there's, there's a sort of element of freedom or chance that also I like to keep as part of the overall process. So, but at the same time, I wouldn't say it's an accident. Right? I would say everything is very intentional, deliberate. There are decisions that are also not just practical of like how, like in terms of what you reference of like the weight or the physics or that this thing has to like stand up. Um, um, but, 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 but yeah, I don't know. Like um, there aren't, and, and I guess like I, ha I, I mean, I think I, I, I see the importance of that question and rules are important, but I would say it's more loose and kind of does like the guiding principle are like you know i mean at the end of the day it's kind of like does it look good <laughs> you know certainly um so it's 2 31 so i think we are getting to the end of the lecture and the end of the questions unless there is a last one that we can squeeze in can i ask one really quick elena go for it um Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for sharing the work. Um, I'm just wondering, since you said yourself is like a very intense sense of um, collectiveness in the work, uh, whether that is the models of cohabitation or the Coachella Valley installation being always photographed with a lot of people, um, or even the figures you use occupying the models. Um, and this is a terribly stereotypical question, but um, have you rethought about this sense of collectiveness under the current circumstances in the pandemic context? Like, can you ever imagine your work renouncing that sense of aggregation and that sense of collectiveness? Could, could you reduce the collective to the individual pieces that you use? Yeah, that's a great question. Like, so all the work I showed is obviously like pre COVID. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I've certainly been thinking a lot about what all of that, uh, all of like, you know, now you're seeing like all sorts of new design regulations of like six feet or the plastic purse specs um, in like restaurants or in stores. Um, I, I, I mean, I guess my answer is more of like in my own intuition at this point. Um, I'm all like, I, I think people do have a desire to be collective, right? Um, or to be, and I, and I think um, like sort of what I'm sort of imagining in some of those more extreme models is, is not, is like a collectivity also of like different people's aesthetic agendas, 
not just a single aesthetic agenda, which is also where that becomes important, not only in say working with other people, but that's also where kind of collecting really helps too, because I'm kind of collecting many, many different things and then I'm altering some of them in some kind of way, right? So I guess like the vision there is like, you know, I guess it's like a counter vision to like one of suburbia, which I would say is the exact model, like suburbia in a way, like the model of suburbia somehow uh, preempts like the de design guidelines of COVID, right? Like everyone's in their own isolated box as like a kind of family. All the boxes feel or look kind of banal and are all the same, right? So I guess, um, I think it's a quite like something to, that I don't have an answer to at this current moment, but I, I, I don't, I think I will still keep pushing for a kind of collectivity. Now that collectivity might be six feet apart for a while or for maybe in perpetuity, I don't know, right? But I think there can still be a sense of collectivity despite having to be six feet apart. With a mask on. <laughs> so I, um, again, I wanna thank uh, Andrew for his generosity and for uh, a very good contribution to our lecture series. Um, so thank you for sharing with us uh, a bit of the background behind the models. I think it's very useful to the students that are now at home making the miniature models to see how miniatures operate in your work. They found object populate uh, your fantasy and how then they relate to your architectural project. So thank you for that. I think it's quite fitting what the students are doing right now. So that you know, Andrew, um, I explained this to the students, basically this lecture series is about four months and I try to um, invite, um, I think people that could talk about the formats uh, of making a thesis or a project uh, in this specific pandemics and how format is becoming actually critical today. And I think you have brought a uh, critical and intellectual contribution explaining how those model can fit a much larger spectrum of architectural processes that, and you've done a great job um, explaining this to the students so they understand the lineage of the work and the implication that it had, uh, disciplinary implication. So, um, Thank you all for your time. I know that tonight we have um, a movie at six and I'm sure all of you have your meeting with your instructors. So sorry again for um, going a bit longer. I'm sorry I was late. Thanks for having oh, me. No, I'm so sorry. No, don't worry. Actually, you know, this lecture with Zoom are quite great because students are quite engaged and ask questions. And I think there is a weird intimacy with the screen that allows them to think, pay attention and, um, be really present so thank you for being with us thanks for having me i really right. appreciate it thank you okay bye everyone <laughs>